Facebook family. Welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. Um, tonight we actually want to talk about spiritual warfare. Our topic is let's get ready to rumble. And so our text is a very well-known um, passage of scripture, Ephesians 6. I'm going to read verses 10 through 20. Um, but I'm going to focus not on the whole armor of God, which is why this scripture is so well known, but the few verses that come before that. But we'll, we'll read the whole thing. Um, but before we get into our scripture and our lesson for tonight, let's open up with a word of prayer. So if you'll just bow your head with me and pray with me. Father, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for the privilege and the opportunity to stand behind your sacred desk and to teach your word to your people. And I pray now, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you would hide me behind the cross so that they don't see me or hear me, but that they see you, hear you, and respond to you. Father, you are the faithful God that has called me. You said you also would do it. I pray that you would do it now, God, for your glory, for your holy name's sake, and for the advancement of your great kingdom. Have your way tonight. Give us a word, Father, that we can hide in our hearts so that we won't sin against you. Give us a word that will help us to grow in our relationship with you. Give us a word, Father, that will help us to navigate this walk, this journey with you, God. In the name of Jesus, give us a word that will help us to be more victorious in our everyday lives. We come with great expectation that you will speak. Speak, Father, tonight. Bread of heaven, feed us until we want no more. I thank you, God, in advance for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's get ready to rumble. Um, and so Ephesians 6, 10 to 20, I'm reading from the NIV. I'm reading our text tonight from the NIV. And it reads, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and having you have done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist and with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Amen. So as we get into the word of God tonight, it's kind of um, the lessons in a couple of different sections. I'm going to talk about things we need to know as we talk about spiritual warfare. It's kind of um, like a buzzword. You probably have heard it before. I don't know if you ever had a lesson in spiritual warfare before. But spiritual warfare is real. We have a spirit. God is a spirit. The Bible says God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so we are in a spiritual war and there are some things that we need to know. And so I'm going to talk about some things that we need to know. And then we're going to talk about, well, how do I rumble? If I said, let's get ready to rumble. How do I rumble? How do I fight? How do I engage in this war that I'm talking about that we're in? And so as we get into um, the word of God tonight and the things that what you need to know, the first thing I need to know is I need to know that I'm in a fight. I can't win a fight if I don't know I'm in a fight. And so we have to understand, child of God, that we are in a fight. That's what Paul's talking about. He's at the end of his letter to the believers at Ephesus. He's in prison. And my sanctified imagination, I am not imagine that he gets this illustration of the whole armor of God. He's probably laying or sitting between a few soldiers. He's probably looking at some Roman soldiers and their whole armor and begins to think about spiritual war. And so he uses their physical armor to describe the spiritual armor that we should have on. But when he starts um, this kind of this pericope at the end of the book of Ephesians, he says, listen, finally, like I'm done saying what I need to say. Finally, the last thing I want to leave you with is I want you to be strong in the Lord 
and in the power of his might or in his mighty power. We are strong in God's mighty power. And he says, I need you to put on the full armor of God. He's, he wants us to understand because we need armor because we're in a war so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. The devil has schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. And then he goes through this list. And in Ephesians 6, 12, I mentioned it before when I taught a lesson a couple weeks ago on delving in the occult. We talked about spiritual warfare a little bit that night. It was actually that night when I knew that the Lord wanted me to um, teach a whole lesson just on spiritual warfare. But in verse 12, NIV says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And so what he's doing is he's helping us to understand, listen, I know you got into an argument with your spouse or your kid or your coworker or whomever, but that's not who your struggle is against. He wants us to understand that we are in a spiritual warfare. And when he goes down this list, one version says against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, he is listing a demonic hierarchy, like a demonic government, similar to how we have a president, and we have governors, and we have senators, and we have mayors, and we have council people, and they're all in government, they're all in politics, they have different jurisdiction, and so here he's letting us know that there is a demonic hierarchy, and that's what we truly struggle against, and we'll talk a little bit about that demonic hierarchy as we go on, and and so verse 13 says, therefore, I need you to put on your full armor of God so when the day of evil comes, you'll be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, that you'll be able to stand. And so here, clearly, clearly, we, we teach and talk a lot about putting on the whole armor of God. But then I feel at the same time, we don't really think about day to day the fact that we are in a spiritual war. You know, why do I need armor unless I'm in a war? Why do I need armor unless I'm in a battle? So you can't win a fight unless you know you're in one. And that's why we are talking about that tonight. That's why I believe the Lord has led me to this text. The second thing that I need to know is I need to know that the devil comes. He wants to kill you. He wants to steal anything he can steal. He wants to destroy. When he attacks us, he tries to discourage he tries to immobilize, and he tries to discredit the believer. John 10.10 10 says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. This is Jesus talking. He says, I've come that they might have life and that they have, might have life more abundantly. And again, John 10.10 10 is a, a familiar passage of scripture because we usually gravitate to the second half of the verse when Jesus says, I come that you might have life and that you might have life more abundantly. But before he says why he came, he talks about why the devil's here. The devil, the thief comes. He comes. He does not come except. The only reason he comes is to steal, to kill, and to destroy you. And so we have to know that. We have to be aware of that. And so that we recognize him. Because the third thing I need to know is the devil is strategic. You have to know your opponent because I want to suggest to you that your opponent knows you. And he, he fights you according to your weaknesses and your temptations, which we'll get into in a little bit. But the devil is strategic. He is smart. He is crafty. He is cunning. And he fights dirty. And so these are things that I have to know if I'm going to be in a fight. I have to be aware that he is. You don't have to worry. You don't have to be afraid. One of the things that I also said when we were talking about delving in the occult is that you never have to be afraid when you are in Christ because 1 John 4, 4 teaches me that greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. So the Holy Spirit, child of God, if you are saved, if you believe Jesus died on the cross for your sins and you have accepted him as your Savior, you are saved. The Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. Literally, God lives in you. And so you don't have to be afraid of the enemy because God is greater, but you do have to be aware that he is smart and that he is crafty and that he is strategic. And you have to know how he fights and you have to know what you're looking for, which is what we're going to talk about tonight. You know, the devil wants us to believe first that he's not real because you can't want to fight you don't know you're in. So he wants you to think. He does things strategically to make us think he's not real. And then if he can't convince you that he's some fictitious character, then he tries to either present himself as harmless 
or is like some, you know, red devil with a pitchfork and horns and looks scary. If you see him, you would cross the street and go the other way. But the Bible says that he masquerades as an angel of light. Let me read the scripture in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 and 14. From the New Living Translation, Paul is talking about some false apostles. And this is what he says, 2 Corinthians 11, 13 and 14. These people are false apostles. They are deceitful workers who disguise themselves as apostles of Christ. But I'm not surprised, even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. One version says that he masquerades as an angel of light because he wants to trick us. He always is pretending to be something he's not, which is why we not only need wisdom and discernment from God, but we need to know that so that we are not ignorant of his devices, which is the next verse scripture of scripture that I want to read. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and I would love for you to read that whole chapter when you get a chance, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm just going to read verses um, 10 and 11 for right now. Paul is talking about um, someone who uh, had gotten in trouble. He had done some dirt in the church. I know that would never happen now. But verse 10 says, when you forgive this man, I forgive him too. And when I forgive whatever needs to be forgiven, I do so with Christ's authority for your benefit so that Satan will not outsmart us. For we are familiar with his evil schemes. Because in this text, they had kind of put the man out and everything until, you know, because he was in sin and all that. And Paul is saying, well, it's time to forgive him. It's time to welcome him back in the fold. We don't want him to be discouraged beyond measure. We want to help him get right. He says, because we can't let Satan outsmart us. One of the schemes of the devil is to divide and conquer. His discord and division is what the devil does. He's always trying to cause arguments with, with people, break up relationships, because he divides and conquers. And so Paul's like, listen, we can't let Satan outsmart us. We are familiar with his evil schemes. One version says that we cannot be ignorant of Satan's devices. If you are in a fight and you have an opponent, you have to know how they fight. You have to know what their schemes are. You have to know what they're fighting. So, and even, you know, in boxing, and even like in other sports, basketball and stuff, they watch the tapes of the people they're going to play or they watch the tapes of the people they're going to fight so that they can study their opponent because i got to know how my opponent fights. If I know how my opponent fights, then I have a better chance of beating them. If I know how my opponent plays, if I know what the strong, strong side is or his weak side is, I have a better chance of being victorious when I'm in the, the ring with him. And so we have to recognize that, yes, the devil is strategic, and we can't let him outsmart us. We can't be ignorant of his devices. We have to know how he works and what he does. We have to know the way that he fights us and how he lies. And so we're going to talk about it tonight. And part of the reason um, why I believe that God led me to teach this tonight is because another thing I need to know is that he attacks the growing and maturing believer. And so, yes, the devil's a liar. He attacks all of us all the time. But he really wages war against the growing and the maturing believer. What do I mean? He already tried to keep you from getting saved. He already tried to kill you before you got saved, but God blocked it. He didn't let it happen. And now you're saved and you belong to the Lord. So the next thing he's trying to do is keep you weak and carnal and pitiful. He doesn't want you praying. He doesn't want you studying. He doesn't want you growing in your relationship with God because he knows that even though, see this is part of his strategy, even though the devil has a lot of power, he knows that he's no match for God. He knows that if I ever learn the power that God has vested in me, if I ever begin to walk in the authority that God has given me, he told me in his word, he told me in Luke 10, 19, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy, and so nothing shall by any means harm you. And so what the devil is banking on is the devil is banking on the fact that I will never learn that, that I will never fully understand that, that I will never walk in that. The devil is hoping and banking on the fact that every time something happens to me, I go to my worldly weapons to fight back. Like the Bible says, we don't, oh, as a matter of fact, let me read another scripture. Let me read for you 2 Corinthians 10. 3 to 5, it says, we are human, 
right? This is Paul talking again. This is 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 5. We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. And so he's like, listen, I know you are a human being. I'm a human being. But even though we're human, we don't fight like humans. This is not a fight that a gun is going to help you. This is not a fight. You don't need a knife. You don't need a taser. We're going to talk about what you need on the second half of this lesson. We're going to talk about how we need the word of God. We're going to talk about how we need prayer. And we're going to need to know how we're fought. But he says, listen, we are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. Let me read another really well-known passage of scripture, but I want to read it in this context and talk about it for a minute, and that's Romans 12.2. Um, Romans 12.2 from the NLT says, Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. This is why I need to read the word of God. This is why I need to study. This is why I need to uh, meditate on the word of God, because God uses his word to transform me into a new person by changing the way that I think. Why did I read that right now? Because one of the things we use is God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down strongholds of human reasoning. We pull down strongholds. We cast down imaginations. He has to change the way we think. I want you to think about your life. I want you to think about something that you used to do that you don't do anymore. Maybe a habit or a sin, something that you used to be engaged in, maybe before you were saved, maybe since you've been saved, but you have grown and the Lord has healed you and delivered you. I want you to think about something specific, right, that you used to do, something that you used to enjoy, and now you don't do it anymore. Well, what happened? What happened? Like, did weed stop making you high? Is that why you stopped smoking it? No. What happened? What happened was God used his word to change the way you think. He used his word to pull down your, your human reasoning. He changed your mind. What he did is he changed your mind and then your behavior followed. Let me read one more scripture um, because I feel like y'all don't believe me yet, but that's okay. I'm going to give you a word until you believe me. In Romans chapter, Romans chapter 6, right? You still thinking about that thing that you used to do? Um, it says... Uh, I'm going to start at verse 19, Romans 6, 19 to, uh, I don't know. Because of the weakness of your human nature, I am using the illustration of slavery to help you understand this. Previously, you let yourselves be slaves to impurity and lawlessness, which led ever deeper into sin. Now you must give yourselves to be slaves to righteous living so that you will become holy. Verse 20. When we were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do what's right. And what was the result? You are now ashamed of the things you used to do, things that end in eternal doom. That was verse 21. I read 19 through 21. Listen, Paul's talking and he's explaining, he's using slavery as an illustration because to help us understand that we were slaves to sin. We used to be slaves to sin. And getting saved, like the day you got saved, you were still a slave to sin. You were just saved and on your way to heaven. Like the Holy Spirit came and he um, began to dwell on the inside of you and he began to change you. But sanctification is a process. He forever made holy those who are being made perfect, those who are being sanctified. And so every day I'm not sinless, but I'm sinning less. I'm growing in my relationship with the Lord. But here's what happened. And I love this verse in verse 21. I'm going to read 20 and 21. You used to be a slave to sin. You were free from the obligation to do what's right. But look, verse 21 says, what was the result? You are now ashamed of the things you used to do. 
things that et in an eternal do. And you don't even, you at home, we're not even in church. So you don't have to try to look real sanctified or nothing like that. You can acknowledge, you can nod your head and acknowledge that I'm talking to you, that there are some things that you used to do. There are some things that you used to enjoy. There are some things that you used to pay for. There are some places you used to go. And you're now, not only do you not do them anymore, but you're now ashamed of the fact that you used to do them. Well, what happened? God changed your mind. He changed your mind. He pulled down the stronghold of human reasoning, and he used his word to change the way you think. And so he changed you, and that's the power of the word, and that's what the devil doesn't want us to do. That's the way he doesn't want us to grow. He couldn't keep you from being saved, but now he fights you in your growing. And so, you know, when I say that he fights the maturing believer, here's what I mean. Here's part of what I mean. And... I want you to think about, um, you know, your life, right? And so you're trying to grow. You're trying to be more consistent in your devotional time, maybe. Maybe you're trying to be more consistent in your reading of the Word of God. Maybe you're trying to be more consistent in prayer. All of these things, spiritual disciplines, all of these things are really good. I need you to know that the amount of distractions you have when you try to read your Bible is not coincidence. When you read in Terry McMillan's new book, don't nobody bother you. But as soon as you open your Bible and you try to read your Bible, then people be calling you, the kids are crying, you know, everything seems like all hell is breaking loose because you're trying to read your Bible. I want you to know that that's spiritual warfare. I want you to know that that's the devil trying to keep you from reading. Same thing with prayer. He will read and you know in bed. You got insomnia any other night. You decided you're going to open your Bible and read a little bit before you go to bed. You wake up tomorrow don't know what happened. You fell asleep instantly when you were trying to read your Bible. Same thing with prayer. You figure you're going to spend a few minutes in prayer talking to the Lord. You wake up the next day like what happened. And any other time you wake up. Now you wanted to watch a two hour movie. If you decide you want to you know turn on Netflix or whatever and watch a movie you would stay awake for the whole movie. But when you try to spend some time in prayer it's like your eyes got heavy and you couldn't keep your eyes open and I want you to know child of God that that's not coincidence I want you to pay attention that the devil is fighting you in any way he can because what he doesn't want you to do is grow he doesn't want you to he does not want you to grow because as we grow in our relationship with him we understand that we are victorious and we understand that he does not have the power over us even though he's powerful and even though he fights us we begin to learn and understand that God has given us authority over all the power of the enemy and we begin to walk in that authority and then when somebody come at me sideways and say something out their mouth that they ain't got no business saying instead of me cussing them out I don't say anything and I begin to pray and ask God to help me and I begin to use godly weapons not worldly weapons and the devil's no match for godly weapons and so I need you to understand because some of you have become so discouraged you become so discouraged as you try to pray you become so discouraged as you try to grow in your relationship with the Lord and read your Bible more it seemed like all hell didn't start breaking loose in your life until you try to get closer to God and I want to tell you I want to validate you and tell you that that actually yeah yes sweetheart that's actually exactly what happened because what the devil wants you to do is he wants you to think oh this ain't worth it if I was fine when I wasn't reading my Bible and now everybody in my house is getting on my nerves because I'm trying to read my Bible. He wants you to give up reading your Bible feeling like, well, that's not worth it. Oh, but it is worth it. He knows. That's how he's fighting you. He's strategic and he's crafty because he knows the power. He knows better than us the power that we wield when we are walking. As a matter of fact, I read it in our text and I'm going to come back to it. Um, a little bit later, but one of, and when we put on the whole armor of God, um, I read it in our text, verse 17, Ephesians 6, 17, it says, you know, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, our sword is our only offensive weapon, and the sword is the word of God, it is how we fight, everything else is armor, even our shield, which is faith, even our shield, which keeps 
the enemy's fiery darts from actually hitting us. Our faith stops it before it gets to us, but that's still defensive. Our only offensive weapon is the word. So if there's anything the devil does not want you to do, it is learn the word. I have talked to people so many times when I try to encourage them to memorize scripture just because of the power of hiding the word of God in our heart. Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. And so if you had a conversation with me more than 10 or 15 minutes, I am sure I have encouraged you to memorize scripture verses, right? And I have told, so many people have told me that they can't memorize scripture, but you can sing every word of your favorite song. You can quote every line of your favorite movie. The devil is a liar. You ain't got no memory problems. Don't even claim having memory problems. It's just the devil's fighting you for memorizing scripture because he knows the power in it. But you need to declare, I will memorize the word of God. I will meditate on it. I will visualize it. I will rehearse it until I know it. And then I will hide that word in my heart so that I can fight the devil with it. And so here, you know, the scripture that comes to my mind is in Matthew chapter 4, right? Matthew chapter 4, I think it's like verses 1 to 11. That's when Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days. And when the devil is tempted, now you know that if the devil's fighting Jesus, that the devil's going to fight you. You know if the devil's going to tempt Jesus, the devil's going to tempt me. We are not above the temptation of the enemy. And so the devil went and tempted Jesus. This is Jesus. This is the son of the living God. And every time the devil came at him with something, Jesus fought back with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Jesus fought back with, it is written, it is written, it is written. Every time the devil tries to lie to you, the devil tries to lie to you all the time. That's what he does. When he lies, the Bible says it's consistent with his character. As a matter of fact, I'm going to read it because I'm already in John. John chapter 8, verse 44. Let me read it. Um, exactly. It says, for you, this is Jesus talking, for you are children of your father, the devil, and you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. And when he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. I want you to think about that. When he lies, it is consistent with his character. One version says that lies is his native tongue. Like I am speaking English right now, the devil speaks lies. So you need, we need to recognize when the devil's the one talking because if the devil's talking, you know that everything he's saying is a lie. It is the devil that tells you that you can't do it. Yes, you can. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. It's the devil that says you can't make it. It's the devil that says it will never happen. Yes, it will happen because blessed is she who believes there shall be a performance of those things which were told her by the Lord. And so you need to fight the devil in every lie that he would tell you with the word of God the same way Jesus does because it is the sword of the spirit. The devil attacks the maturing and growing believer. I need you to know that the devil will attack your relationships. He will attack your marriage. He will attack your familial relationships, um, mothers with children, fathers with children. He, will, he attacks anything that God has ordained and put in place. The enemy will attack it to tear it down because he wants to divide and conquer. The devil will attack your ministry. And I was thinking about how to save this because when we think ministry so often, it is probably the fault of the church. When we think ministry, we always think of like preaching or teaching, maybe deacons and ushers. You know, we think about that. But I want to suggest to you that we all have a ministry. If, no matter how God is using you, if God uses you to encourage someone, you are ministering to them and God is using you. So when I say ministry, I'm talking about anything that God gets the glory out of. I'm talking about Matthew 5. 14 to 16 when Jesus says you are the light of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket instead a lamp is placed on a stand Where it gives light to everyone in the house in the same way Let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly father And so your marriage is your ministry motherhood is a ministry Fatherhood is a ministry. Encouraging others is a ministry. Being neighborly is a ministry. Pulling up your neighbor's trash can back to the house when you pull up your trash can back to the house is ministry. Anything you do in God is glorified. Being kind to others. Being honest. 
All of that is ministry. And I'm saying when you strive to do the right and the righteous thing, the enemy will fight you. I had a friend who, um, there was a car that was illegally parked on the corner. And so when she turned, it was dark. She was headed to work. And so she didn't see the bumper and she misjudged it. And so she hit the car, right? It's like 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. The car was already illegally parked. But the God in her, when her car was fine, didn't have a scratch on it, but she tore up the other car. And the God in her would not allow her to keep going. So she got out, I think it was raining and everything, and she put a note on the car with her number, her name, her number, her information, and she owned what she had done. Only the God in her would do something like that. And I am saying to you, I know that that is ministry, and I don't know how it all worked out. I don't know if the person whose car she tore up was saved or not, but I'm saying if it didn't happen immediately, there will be a time in that person's life where they will recognize that that person must have been a Christian because who does that? Who owns a mistake when no one's watching? Only a Christian who understands that God is always watching. Only a Christian who understands that God is our audience. And I'm saying if God gets the glory out of it, it is ministry and the enemy will fight you. And so we have to recognize that. Another thing I need you to know, child of God, is the bigger you are, the harder the devil wants you to fall. What do I mean by that? I'm saying the greater your influence, the more the devil wants you to fall. So as God uses you and gives you more influence and you encourage more people, like Barnabas, maybe you're the Barnabas and people know that you're always encouraging somebody, or maybe you are a minister, or maybe you are a deacon, or maybe you are a leader in your church, or maybe you're just a leader in your family, or maybe just people look up to you. Maybe you don't have a title, but you, you're you that one in your friend group that always got a scripture. You're that one in the friend group that's always like, let's pray. You know, you're the one, you know, in the scripture that bring God into every conversation and your friends laugh and it's they cool with it, but they know that you're just that one. You know what I'm saying? And then the devil knows that and what he tries to do because he's strategic is he knows that if he can make you fall, that he will get your whole friend group because your friend group, whether or not they admit it, whether or not they say it, whether or not they talk about it, they see you and they admire your relationship with God. And so if the devil can make you fall, then he can pull down others. And so the, that's why it's so important that you pray for your pastor. That's why it's so important that you pray for your leaders because the more influence a person has in the kingdom of God, the more the devil fights them. And if you think about it, it makes sense. If I have a strategic opponent and I am being mentored or discipled or whatever by you, and I am learning how to walk this walk with Christ from watching the example that you set for me, and then you mess up, and then you fall, not that I should have ever put you on a pedestal in the first place, however, comma, then you fall, now I'm all messed up. So why would the devil need to attack me when he knows that if he attacks you, he gets you and he gets me? And so I am just saying that, you know, you've probably heard the expression, new level, new devil. And I talked in the very beginning about Ephesians 6.12, about the de demonic hierarchy, that there are some demons that are stronger than other demons. And I want to suggest to you that as you grow in your relationship with God and as your ministry grows, no matter what your ministry is, and I spent some time giving you examples of ministry. No matter what your ministry is, as you grow, the reason you're fought the way you're fought is because the devil knows if he can just take you down, if he can just take you down, that he will get a hundred other people to fall too. And so instead of spending his time on those a hundred other people individually, it makes sense for him to concentrate his effort against you because strategically it's in his best interest just to wait on it and get you to fall because if he can just get you to mess up, if he can just get you to fall, he knows, even though you human as they are, he knows that he'll get the other ones. It's like in bowling, you try to get that center pin, but you can't hit the center pin head on if you want to strike. You got to hit the center pin, but you got to hit it on the side. It's almost like you got to hit it between the center pin and the next pin. And so you got to get the center pin, but you got to get it from the side. And if you get the center pin just right, you will knock down every pin there because one pin knocks down the next pin, which knocks down the next pin, which knocks down the next pin. The devil understands collateral damage. 
He understands collateral damage, and that's why y'all need to pray for your leaders, and that's why you need to pray. If there's someone in your life that um, you look up to, that you admire, especially if it has to do with spiritually, then you need to be praying for them, because here's what I can promise you. I can promise you that the devil is fighting them. The next thing I want to point out to you is something that you may or may not have noticed, um, is when you have a great victory for God, when you do something great for God, it's always followed by spiritual, emotional, and um, very often physical fatigue. You know, when you do something great for God, um, a great manifestation of human weakness usually follows. And here's the problem. You're like, oh, I don't do nothing great for God. But your great for God is not the same as God's great for God. It's not the same as the enemy's great for God. So often, child of God, we're so hard on ourselves. I don't even know why. So often we minimize our influence and we minimize our effect. All I did was pray for her. All I did was encourage her. All I did was take her some groceries. All I did was send her a card. And we minimize how God uses us. And so when the devil attacks us, we are caught off guard because we feel like we hadn't done anything special. But you'll be surprised what great for God looks like. We think we need some big platform where we are preaching or teaching to thousands of people or affecting change to millions of people across the globe in order for it to be great for God. But I want to challenge you in the Gospels as you read the ministry of Jesus. Jesus had the ministry of one. I want to suggest to you, yeah, yeah, sometimes he fed 5,000, but more often than not, Jesus' ministry was to one person. Jesus always sees the one. And when he uses you, when he leads you to call someone, when he leads you to pray for someone, when he leads you to sow into someone's life, when he leads you to send a card or say an encouraging word or make a phone call and you are obedient, you don't know the magnitude of the effect that your obedience had. It sounds small, it looked small, it felt small because it didn't take you much to do it, perhaps. But when you were obedient to the voice of God and you did what he told you to do, you don't know the impact that it had on the other side. You just don't know. When we talk about um, the apostles, like if I talk about the 12 disciples or whatever, Almost everybody, saved and unsaved, if you ask them who's one of the 12 disciples, almost everybody would say Peter, right? Maybe, you know, if you've been in church for a while, you might know Peter, James, and John, right? God's Jesus inner circle. But Peter, but I wonder how many people know that Andrew, Andrew was one of the disciples. But here's the thing about Andrew, Andrew was Peter's brother. And Peter, and Andrew witnessed to Peter. Andrew is the reason Peter is saved. And so it may have seemed like a small thing, but Andrew found out about Jesus and was like, wait a minute, let me go get my brother. And he went and he got Peter and was like, come on. And then he brought Peter to Christ. And so we think about Peter and we think about how Peter was preaching and we think about how all these people that got saved when Peter was preaching. But what about the crowns in heaven for Andrew? Like people don't know Andrew's name as well as they know Peter's name. And Andrew might have felt like it was a small thing because all he did was tell his brother about Jesus. But what if he never did? What if Andrew never told Peter about Jesus? You know, Peter, on this rock will I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Somebody had to bring Peter to Christ. And it was Andrew, his brother. And I am saying, because I feel like I need to minister to all the Andrews. Everybody can't be Peter. But don't you minimize the impact of your obedient life before God. Don't minimize your ministry because the devil knows and the devil fights you. He fights you with discouragement. He fights you with fear. There's so many things that the devil fights you with because he wants to immobilize you. He wants to try to discredit you. He wants to kill. He wants to steal. And he wants to destroy. And so I am telling you, let me give you a couple of biblical examples. I'm not even going to turn to it, but I will tell you in 1 Kings 18 and 19, you can um, read it when you get a chance. I taught a lesson a, a couple months ago when the oppressed get depressed from 1 Kings 19. But 1 Kings chapter 18, we have Elijah, the man of God, and there's a big contest on Mount Carmel. And he calls down through the power of God. He calls down fire from heaven and ends up killing 450, 450 
prophets of Baal. You want to talk about a great victory, right? That's clearly a great victory for God. And that's in 1 Kings chapter 18. By the time we get to 1 Kings chapter 19, one chapter later, right after that great victory, the man of God is so depressed that he's asking God to kill him. He sits under a juniper tree and says, God, just kill me. He's so depressed, and his focus is so off-center. And, and so I am telling you that that's not rare. I am telling you that we need to look out for it, and we need to be cognizant of it, because when the Lord uses you, you need times of refreshing to come. And in um, the book of Acts, I think it's Acts 3.19, um, it says that times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. And when that's why it's so important that we have a prayer life and a study life and a devotional life and spend time with God because we need times of refreshing to come from the presence of the Lord. Um, the scripture that comes to my mind in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 says, We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God and not from ourselves. You know, we have, one version says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Like my vessel is a clay jar. I'm, I'm human, I'm weak, I'm faulty, I'm frail, I'm fragile, I'm feeble. You know, I have God's treasure, his Holy Spirit in this body, in this clay jar, that the excellency of the power will be of God and not of myself. It makes it clear that the great power comes from God and not from me. But then if the great power comes from God and not from me, then when God uses me greatly, then I am susceptible in my weakness to be fought by the devil. I pray all the time against the spirits of backlash and retaliation like the devil. There's no way. It's like this. It's like if you punch somebody in the face and then you just stand there like this. Listen, you might even knock them down, but if you just stand here with your hands on your hip, they're coming back for you. Like, they're going to do their best to hit you back. And you can't um, strike a blow to the kingdom of darkness and the enemy not try to fight you back. Because what he definitely don't want you do, doing is that again. What he definitely doesn't want you to do is encouraging somebody again. He might have had somebody on the brink of suicide. He had been working on them for months, and he had them on the brink of suicide. And here you come calling them. Here you come encouraging them. Here you come telling them how much God loves you, messing up the devil's whole plan. And you feel like it was a small thing because maybe you didn't even know that they were on the brink of suicide. Maybe you just called them because you felt like the Lord wanted you to. Maybe you just sent them a card to encourage them because you felt led to. And you're just trying to be a good Christian and you don't even know the magnitude because God don't always tell us the magnitude of our impact. You probably couldn't handle understanding the magnitude of our impact. All you got to ever do, child of God, is be obedient. If God leads you to do something, do it. If God leads you to say something, say it. If God leads you to give something, give it. All you ever have to do is be obedient. But the devil knows the impact that you have better than you know the impact that you have. And like Elijah, after that great victory, he was so low that he wanted to die. Let me read. Uh, it's already 715, so this is clearly going to be a two-week lesson. But I'm not going to rush through it because it's too good. Let me read another example in Judges 15, um, verses 14 and 19. As Samson arrived at Lehi, the Philistines came shouting in triumph, but the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon Samson, and he snapped the ropes on his arms as if they were burnt strands of flax, and they fell from his wrists. Then he found the jawbone of a recently killed donkey, and he picked it up and killed a thousand Philistines with it. Then Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, I have piled them in heaps. With the jawbone of a donkey, I've killed a thousand men. When he finished his boasting, he threw away the jawbone, and, and the name of that place was Jawbone Hill. So I'm going to pause there for a minute. I'm going to read through verse 19. I just stopped at 17. So here we have Samson. You Bible readers may be familiar with Samson, the incredible strength that God had given him. He was a Nazarite from birth. His, um, he was, his mother was told never to cut his hair, and that's where his strength um, lied. And so here, the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon Samson. He had superhuman strength because of the, the power of God. And in this text that I'm reading, 
he picked up a jawbone of a recently killed donkey and he killed a thousand men. He killed a thousand Philistines, a thousand of the enemy with the jawbone of a donkey. One man killed a thousand people. You want to talk about a great victory, right? All right, let me keep reading. Verse 18. Samson was now very thirsty and he cried out to the Lord, you have accomplished this great victory by the strength of your servant. Must I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of these pagans? So God caused water to gush out of a hollow in the ground at Lehi, and Samson was revived as he drank. And then he named that place the spring of the one who cried out, and it is still there to this day. So in verse 18, he just killed a thousand men, and now he's about to die of thirst. He's about to die of thirst because he is a human being. It was the power of God that enabled him to kill a thousand men. But after that great victory, he became very in touch with the weakness of his humanity. And in his humanity, just like every other man, just like every other woman, we need water to live and he didn't have any water. And this man that God just used to kill a thousand people is Gary God because he don't have a glass of water. And what I am saying, just like I use Elijah as an example and I'm using Samson as an example, I want you to think about that. These are things when we, when I talk about not being ignorant of Satan's devices, being aware of his schemes, I am telling you that we have to remember because sometimes when, when God uses us to do great things, and he uses us to do great things all the time. But sometimes it might be a great thing and you know it's a great thing. Like, like Samson, he killed a thousand people. He knew that was a great thing. And when he killed a thousand people, he, then he started singing, right? He was real hype. He said, listen, he started singing a song. With the jawbone of a donkey, I've piled them in heaps. With the jawbone of a donkey, I've killed a thousand men. He started feeling himself like, yeah, yeah, I got him. Where, anybody else, who next? And so it was God, but God used him. And so he was excited about the victory. And I don't know if there's necessarily, I'm not saying that he was wrong for singing that or whatever. I am saying that there is a clear distinction between the power of God, what you can do with the power of God, and the reality that you still are just a human being, that you're just human. And he was very thirsty. And so he had just killed a thousand people, but now he's thirsty. Elijah had killed 450 prophets of Baal, but now he's so depressed that he wants to die. And I want you to I want you to be aware. I want you to not only think back, but I want you to be aware going forward as the Lord uses you in whatever way he uses you. And not just in the way that the God is currently using you, but I'm talking about even um, projects or things that you know God is leading you to do. If you have something that you're working on or should be working on, and you seem motivated in every other area of your life, but with the thing, this one thing that you know God told you to do, you're dragging your feet about it. It seems like everything else comes up. You know that God told you to write the book. You know God told you um, to work on this organization. You know God told you to do something specific. You know. I'm not talking about when you're confused. I'm not talking about when you're not sure if it's the Lord. I am saying how you're dragging your feet and you don't, it's almost like you're not even sure why you have so much trouble staying motivated to do the thing God called you to do. And I'm telling you, child of God, it is spiritual warfare and you have to fight through it. Because what the devil doesn't want you to do is the devil doesn't want you to work in that organization the way that God called you to work that organization. What God, what the devil doesn't want you to do is write that book the way he's telling you to write the book. What, what the devil doesn't want you to do is he doesn't want you to finish your podcast. What the devil doesn't want you to do is he doesn't want you to do that thing because he knows the impact that it's going to have for the kingdom of God when you finish it. He knows the impact that it's going to have for the kingdom of God when you follow through and are obedient, obedient and do the thing that God calls you to do. And so I am I want you to recognize that you're being fought so that you can fight that. And so how I got 10 minutes and so we'll start this because all of that is just things I need to know. These are just things that I need to know and they were important. They can't win a fight if I don't know I'm in a fight. I need you to know that the devil comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He wants to discourage, immobilize, and discredit. I need you to know that he is strategic. He is smart. He is crafty. He's not smarter 
And he's not smarter than God, and he's not stronger than God. And God has given authority over him. He just doesn't want us to grow to that place. And so he always strategically attacks the maturing and the growing believer because he wants to discourage you to the point where you quit. And I don't care what it is. And so how do I get ready to rumble? I'm going to give you the first point under this part, and then we'll pick up next week. you got to know how you're fought. You have to know how you're fought. I want to suggest to you that the devil knows how you're fought, and so you have to know how you're fought. Um, 1 Corinthians 6.12 says, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. What does that mean? And you know, since I called the, the lesson, let's get ready to rumble, I'm going to use this boxing illustration. I'm saying don't even get in the ring if you don't have to get in the ring. I'm going to give you tools to fight the enemy. But I'm saying that there are times where you can stay out the ring and you don't, don't set yourself up. You know what your weaknesses are. You know how you're fought. And in this text that I just read in 1 Corinthians 6.12, what Paul is saying is he's saying all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. There are some things that are lawful, like it's not sin. It falls under the category, perhaps, maybe it's on the brink, maybe it's one of them gray areas, maybe it's something that some people get convicted by and some people don't get convicted by, but maybe it's lawful. Like it's not a sin to do it, but all things are not helpful. But it says all things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. I won't, you can't always do what everybody else can do. As you're growing in your relationship with the Lord, I remember watching um, a YouTube video of a young lady who was talking about her celibacy journey, and she was talking about how she had to give up Cardi B. Do you know what I mean? Maybe you can listen to Cardi B, but for the season that she's in, she can't listen to Cardi B. And so that's a perfect example of what I'm talking about because all things are lawful, but all things aren't expedient. All things are not helpful. I can't do anything that's going to cause me to be brought under the power of the enemy. And so maybe there's certain movies that you can't watch because you know you. Maybe there's certain songs or certain artists that you can't listen to because you know you. You get that music in your head and you know where that's going to lead. Maybe everybody's going to um, going down to the restaurant, they're going to sit at the bar at happy hour or whatever and just drink and you're going out with your coworkers. But you know you can't go. You can't go because you can't have one drink. You know, maybe everybody is ordering, you know, dessert or they're passing around a bag of Hershey Kisses, but you know that you can't take one. Everybody's just taking one and passing it around, but you can't take one because you can't eat just one. And you know you. Like, don't set yourself up to fall. You know your boy is having a bachelor party, but you already know a stripper is going to be there, and you know you. Like, you can't even go, not even for a couple hours, because when the, when the party's over, it's not going to be over for you. You know, that's why you can't go to happy hour, because when everybody else is fine and they going home, it's not going to be over for you, because you can't just have one drink. And so what I am saying is, you ain't got to tell everybody all your business, but you got to know you, and you have to know how you're fought, because the devil knows how you're fought, and he's going to bring every temptation to your door, because he wants to kill you, and he wants to steal your joy, your victory, your testimony, and he wants to destroy you, and he's going to use the area where you are weakest, like he's an opponent, so of course, even when you study the tapes of other boxers, boxers, you're looking for their weakness. You're looking for where they leave themselves open to be hit. You're looking for where you can do a counterpunch. You're looking for all of that. And the devil studies you, and he's looking for the areas where you are weak. And if the devil knows where you're weak, then you have to know where you're weak so that you don't, um, that, so that he doesn't outsmart you. So you don't end up like it's already hard enough. There's already going to be spiritual warfare. We're already going to um, have to fight the devil. We're going to spend the majority of our time next week, Lord willing, talking about um, how to fight, how to fight him with the word. I talked a little bit about that, how to fight him in prayer, um, how to fight him in fasting. I'm going to talk about several things. I'm going to spend the whole time next time talking about how to do it. But you, what I am saying to you, child of God, is you already going to have to fight. You are already in a fight, and you are victorious. You know, God before me, who can be against me? But don't set yourself up. 
you know you, you know how weak you are in certain areas. And that's what Paul is saying. He's saying, listen, all things are lawful for me. So there might be something that you can't do. Like, you know, maybe, you know, you date in and he wants you to come over and you know that you can't come over. Not if ain't nobody else home. Not if the kids ain't there. Not if it's just going to be y'all too. Don't set yourself up. You can't go and you know you can't go. And it's the devil that try to convince you that you can go. It's the devil that try to convince you you can have one um, drink. The devil trying to convince you that you can have one potato chip. The devil trying to convince you that you, whatever it is, it is the enemy that's trying to convince you when you know you. Because the devil says, if I can just get him to do this, then I know that I'll have him. If I can just get her to do this then I'll know that I have her. And what I am saying to you is that we're all tempted in different ways. I'm trying my best to think of different um, examples of how we're fought. Because how the devil might be trying to kill me might not be how the devil is trying to kill you. Like, why do you keep going? You know, why do you keep going on um, scrolling the internet and going on Macy's online and going on different clothing stores online just to see if they got something on sale when you're supposed to be fast in purchases? You're not supposed to be charging nothing on your credit card. So why are you trying to see if something they got something on sale? Because if it had it on sale and if it's something that you want, you know you're not strong enough not to buy it. So what you need to do is you need to not go on that website. You need to not do it. You need to stop being a bad steward over your finances. See, you, you ain't want me talking about that sin. But the devil wants to destroy you in that way. He wants to destroy you in whatever way he can. If he wants to destroy you, he wants to kill you. If he can kill you through your body. I remember my mom preached a sermon years ago. It might have been 10 years ago. And she said that you were... I can't remember the whole context of what she said, but she said, you're digging your grave with your teeth. And we was all like, oh, you know, but, you know, by eating, you're, you're, you're digging your grave with your teeth because you are eating stuff that is killing you. And the devil is trying to convince you that this one thing, one, just this one slice of cake won't hurt you. Like just one blizzard won't hurt you, but a blizzard a day will. Like, do you understand what I'm saying? And it doesn't matter what it is. And you feel like, well, one more dress, like, you know, I'm already in debt. I'm, you know, one more dress ain't going to make that, that big of a difference. I need you to recognize that that's a lie from the pit. I need you to recognize how you're fought. You got a problem. How many clothes in your closet right now still got tags on them? Go shopping in your room. You already got enough stuff. Don't buy stuff. But what I am saying is when I say you have to know how you're fought, so what I'm saying is you, I can go on Macy's website and not buy nothing. But if you can't, maybe then you can't go on at all. You know what I'm saying? Maybe girls night out at the casino. you like, nope. Maybe it's harmless, it's fine, but it's not fine for you. Maybe you know that you need not step into a, a, a casino. You know, like you have to know how you're fought. And so we're going to stop there, and I want you to begin. We're going to pick up here next Wednesday. It's going to be good. It's going to be powerful. I'm going to pray for us. I want you to be aware and cognizant over the next week. I want you to pay attention to how you're fought. You're going to be like, oh, the devil is a liar. I want you to pay attention to how you fought when you're trying to read your Bible, how you fought when you're trying to pray. I want you to pay attention to how you fought when you're trying to get closer to God versus when you're doing activities that have no spiritual value and the difference in the level of distraction. And so if you are watching tonight and you never remember a time in your life where you asked Jesus to come into your heart and to save you, today is the day of salvation. The Bible says the day you hear my voice, Pardon not your heart. And so if you are not saved, if you were to die today, you don't know where you would spend eternity, then I want to pray this prayer with you because the Bible says, if I believe it in my heart and confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus, I shall be saved. With the heart man believe it unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And so we're going, I'm going to pray this prayer, and I just want you to repeat the words after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus is your son, and I believe that he died on the cross for my sins. I ask you to come into my heart and save me. I accept that I'm a sinner, and I need a savior. Make me like you. Make me brand new. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you are saved, once saved, always saved. I am excited. I want you praying. I want you praying for you. I want you praying for me. And I will, Lord willing, I will see you next Wednesday at 630. God bless you.